Well, good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you tonight to a very special service. This evening is the continuation of our Holy Week services, the commemoration of Good Friday. We have a number of musical pieces lined up for you. A couple of things to make note of as we begin. Uh, first of all, we will be doing things a little old school this evening. And so for the congregational hymns, we will be pulling out our hymnals and reading from the hymnals. And then secondly, this service will end in darkness and silence. And so during the last hymn, as we're singing, the lights will dim. And then when that hymn is finished, we will leave the sanctuary in silence. Now let us take a moment to center our hearts and minds as we enter into worship.
and for our call to worship. On this day, we gather to remember Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us draw near in full assurance of God's endless love and mercy. We give our thanks and praise to Jesus Christ, who carries our sorrows, heals our wounds, and redeems us from sin and death. Let us now join in our opening hymn, number 286. seated. How, how, how is it possible to get one's mind to the place where it becomes okay to kill someone? We, 
Would you pray with me before we read our scripture? It seems to help God that we can surround ourselves with people who like us and who like our way of thinking and say things that we like and learn to affirm us in whatever we say and learn to agree and we agree and it becomes affirming, inspiring with others who mutter words of agreement and encourage in our ears. How do, we, how do we get to that level of dislike and that level of hatred where we can destroy your creation? It, it, demonization seems to help us, God, where we begin to mutter a list and then it becomes a list that we fill in easily, and then it becomes a list that we pursue. And the more we add to the list about what the person is doing wrong, how they're incomplete, how they're broken, how they're they're just wrong, somehow, the longer that list gets, the easier it is to destroy that person. These are just some of the thoughts that come into our heads on a night like this, in a service like this, where we come in planning to sing hymns and read Scripture that are written on paper, and then you get a hold of our imagination and you start talking to us and you pull us and we see things But we never anticipated. We we grieve things. And we're not sure how it happens. We're not sure at what point it's going to come, but we're terrified that it will. that we remember Jesus was somebody's son. That Mary and Joseph had raised him and children are not supposed to die before their parents. And so on this night, our hands are tight because our knuckles are stretched. There's little marks in the bottom of our palms where our fingernails are pushing in. And our necks are tight and our backs are tight because parents are not supposed to bury their children. Children should not die before their parents. And even though it happens, It's not something we're going to be okay with. It's not something we're going to get past. It's not something we're going to get over or manage in our thinking, God, because it terrifies us. These are just a couple of the thoughts in our heads tonight. And we're willing to have them and we're willing to be scared. And we're willing to feel anger and we're willing to feel befuddlement. And we're willing to be helpless. We're even willing to approach our guilt and our greed. Because we are in your presence. on a night like this. In your name we pray, God. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5, and it reads 
as such. When Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, saw that he had been condemned, Judas was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said. I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, that is your responsibility. So Judas threw the silver pieces into the temple. And then he went away and hanged himself. Good evening. I'll be reading from Matthew 27, 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the, of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no, no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Amen.
was despised. Despised and rejected. Rejected of men. A man of sorrows. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised, rejected. and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised, rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and acquainted with grief, a He gave his back to the smiters. He gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that pluck and off the hair and his cheeks to them that pluck and off the hair and his cheeks to them that pluck and off the hair he hid not his face from shame and spitting he hid not his face from shame, from shame. He hid not his face from shame, from shame and spitting. Despised, despised and rejected, rejected of man, a man of sorrows. sorrows and acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows and acquainted
And now I will be reading from Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 to 44. As they went out, they came upon a man from Kyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, and when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two rebels were crucified with him one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, um, um, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The rebels who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. We are grateful for the gift of Scripture.
A little over a week ago, Martin Greenfield, a tailor to Sinatra, Obama, Trump, and Shaq, died at the age of 95. Greenfield's work with such a varied mix of celebrities and politicians doesn't even begin to tell the story of his remarkable life. He survived the Holocaust as a child. In fact, he first learned certain principles of tailoring when he was a prisoner at Auschwitz, working in the laundry room and mending shirts and uniforms for the German soldiers and guards. And Martin got a break from his work only when the camp took holidays twice a year, Christmas and Easter so that the soldiers and guards could properly worship Jesus. His obituary was published in the New York Times last week. And we read there that at the end of the war, when Auschwitz was liberated by the Allies, General Dwight Eisenhower toured the camp. Greenfield remembered seeing him, and years later, eventually even tailored a suit for Eisenhower. But all of his immediate family died in the Holocaust. He came to the United States after the war, knowing no English, with only $10 in his pocket, mailed to him from a distant relative in the United States. In the years that followed, he established himself as one of the most sought-after tailors in the country, operating from his shop in Brooklyn. And in that obituary, there is a story that is absolutely unforgettable. Martin is separated from all of his family when they first arrive at Auschwitz, except for his father. And before long, he and his father were at a big meeting. The guards of the camp ask which of the prisoners have skills. Martin Greenfield's father, without appearing to even have given it a second thought, instinctively grabs his son's hand raises it and says he has mechanical skills. As a result of his father doing that, he was separated from his father. They never saw each other again. One of the last things his father says to him is, if you survive, you live for us. And Martin Greenfield, who lost his whole immediate family, never forgot that. Martin's son, Todd Greenfield, tells this story and said that's exactly what he did. He successfully realized this commandment from his father to live for the family that he'd lost. As we explored last night, on Monday, Thursday, Holy Week services are not for the casual Christian. They are not meant to make us feel comfortable about our choices or our privileges. Rather, they challenge us to face ourselves 
in our spiritual nakedness. To allow us to take the time we need to contemplate what this week meant to Jesus and his companions. What they experienced. To look deeper into the ways we are prepared or not. To follow Jesus to the end even if that end for us is not what we want. Even if that end means suffering, sacrifice, and perhaps our death as well. Now, being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean we seek to be masochistic or necrophiliacs. But neither does it mean that God promises us a life of carefree ease, success, and prosperity if we choose to walk the road of Jesus. No, there are too many forces in our society that resist God's mission of healing and restoration for God to ever be able to promise us that we may not have to pay the ultimate price ourselves if we are serious about joining God's work of reconciling the world through unconditional love. Casual Christianity mirrors many of the religious folk of Jesus' own day and his own community. This is not the type of religion that sees God as anything other than a divine insurance policy to purchase and hold, to guarantee our protection against an uncertain future. This is the type of religion that loves celebrations, feasts, and holidays, enjoying ourselves first and foremost. This is the type of religion that is willing to give as long as we can afford it. This is the type of religion that wants God to bless what we do and put the divine stamp of approval on our projects, policies, and plans. This is the type of religion that helps us to meet important people in our profession and neighborhoods and move up in our social circles the type of religion that believes that faith should serve politics and that both should be led by the movers and shakers of our society, that makes faith a commodity for purchase with free shipping included, that reassures us that we are in charge so that we can show everyone the right way to be a Christian. But casual Christianity is as uncomfortable with Holy Week as were the crowds who cheered Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem once they saw that his movement was failing and collapsing. When he, as their leader, would be executed and those closest to him, his cabinet, so to speak, would crumble and run for their lives. When we put ourselves in the place of the disciples and the companions of Jesus during his last week, there is so much we don't know. We have to remind ourselves that in those days, especially after they fell asleep in the garden Thursday night, after Jesus was arrested, brought before the Sanhedrin, and then Pilate, beaten and tortured, and then executed on Friday. They did not know what was coming on Sunday. They did not know 
about Jesus' resurrection. All they knew was terror, confusion, betrayal, shame. When Jesus says, it is finished from the cross, we read that anachronistically as his proclamation of the completion of his ministry and life on earth. But to the ears of his friends and companions on that dark Friday afternoon, they probably heard an admission of complete failure, a confirmation of their own fears, the movement that they had dedicated their lives to lay in ruin. Their grand hope of Jesus as the Messiah had come to a shocking and bewildering end. Jesus was executed in public so that all of Jerusalem, all of Israel could see that he was just a man not a God. So that they could see that clearly he was not the king of the Jews because otherwise they wouldn't be able to kill him. That he was clearly not the king of anything. He was dying before their eyes like every other common criminal mercilessly executed by the empire before and after him. There was no angelic rescue. He was taunted. The angels didn't come. Pilate got the final word, as brute force almost always does. God's incarnation of unconditional love so beautifully lived out in this amazing individual, Mary's gentle child of peace and forgiveness, had come to an end. All they knew that Friday afternoon, all they could know that Friday afternoon is that their lives were shattered. It is also not clear to us in Matthew's account what Jesus himself knew or didn't know. And that might sound strange to us. We are used to thinking of Jesus as some sort of superhero who knew everything that God knew because he was divine and the Son of God. But Matthew doesn't portray Jesus in the same mystical light as the writer of John's gospel. For Matthew, Jesus is every bit the Messiah, but also every bit a human being, the Son of Man, as the prophets foretold. Traditional Christian teaching about Jesus' divinity would settle on the formulation a few centuries later that he was fully God and fully human, sometimes also stated as truly God, truly human. That's what we read in the Nicene Creed, and the early church theologians called this the hypostatic union. But if he's fully human, then there had to be times when he didn't know everything either. Human beings are unique creatures. We are the only conscious animals that have self-awareness of our own mortality. That means we know our lives have limits. That means we know we are finite. We know that we have to die. And because we are aware of that finitude, we yearn to find meaning. 
in these precious days that we have. If we had lived the lives of the Greek gods, the immortals, life for us could be anything and choices wouldn't matter. We could do anything. Everything would be possible and therefore everything would be trivial. Morality would be arbitrary and ethics would be absent. Homer's depiction in the Odyssey and the Iliad are scathing critiques of Greek pagan religion and society, but they're also philosophically accurate. Life without death is meaningless. For Homer, the only true heroes are not the gods. They're the human beings who face death knowing that it's real. Yet, if we lived our lives with complete knowledge of the future, we would be prisoners of our own desires to prevent bad future events from happening. We would be so future-obsessed that we couldn't live in or appreciate our present. Again, life would be a cruel prison and pointless. So in this way, to be given the gift of life where we can't live forever and we don't know the future seems like a curse. But in fact, it's a blessing. It's the only way our lives can have meaning. It's the only way our choices matter. It's the only way we can have the freedom to truly live. For Jesus to be fully human, truly human, means that he had to live a life that included finitude, death. And he could not have complete knowledge of his future while living his life here with us. So to be human meant that for Jesus, death was inevitable. But here's the key point. The manner of Jesus' death was not. Or perhaps I'll put it in a different way more accurately. If dying violently at the hands of hate and fear was inevitable, that was because of us, not God. Jesus wasn't sent to die. To preach that the centrality of Jesus' identity is only to be a sacrificial lamb misreads the diversity of centuries of Christian theology and turns our faith into a death cult. Death is never the purpose of life. Rather, death is the limit that allows us to find the purpose to life. Jesus was sent to live. He was sent to live with us and to show us how to live. He died in the way that he did, disgraced, tortured, abandoned, and broken, betrayed. Because of the way we live our lives. Because of the way we have structured our societies. As we said last night, a universal truth of humanity across cultures and across centuries. We fear what we don't understand. And we kill what we fear. But as he faced his death, he was also met with silence, as we all are. And maybe this is the most disturbing part 
of that Friday afternoon. Jesus cries out from the cross and quoting Psalm 22, asks God why God has abandoned him, why God has forsaken him. Some interpretations are quick to say that Jesus quotes this psalm to show how the scripture is fulfilled in his manner of death. Fair enough. But the silence from God to the psalmist and to Jesus is real and undeniable. This is a genuine cry of anguish. Jesus did not pretend to suffer physically or spiritually. There was no escape plan, no exit strategy to avoid what we face. Jesus did not appear to die. He did die. This was not a performance to make us feel like he was one of us. He was one of us. James Carse, a professor of history and literature of religion who taught for many years at NYU, makes a case between two kinds of silence in his book, The Silence of God, Meditations on Prayer. First, there is the silence of obedience. And then there is the silence of expectation. The silence of obedience takes place in the presence of a powerful person and can be based on either authority and respect or on fear and intimidation. And if it's the latter, it's a silence that's meant to oppress us. And we lose our voice. But the silence of expectation is the silence that makes speech possible. Without someone to speak to, our speech is only an echo chamber. It does not create reality or relationships. Without that other person listening to us, we don't have a voice with which to speak and create. When someone listens to us with genuine openness in silence, we will have a voice to say what we have never been able to say and did not even know we could say it. This kind of sensitive listening is the silence that allows us to discover something new about ourselves, to be able to create a new reality for ourselves. The silence of God is the silence of a solidarity of presence beyond words. It is the God who stands next to us when nothing can be said. When answers are futile and platitudes fail miserably. How many of us want to scream at the top of our lungs when someone tries to comfort us in times of loss and suffering by saying something is trite and ridiculous as everything happens for a reason? When people ask me as a theologian to explain why God is silent in the face of horrific violence, agony, and atrocity, I can't. Any more than I can explain why I am silent in the face of those events myself. At those times, we all fall mute. Language dissolves in the overwhelming ocean of pain and suffering beyond our ability to comprehend, much less withstand. 
Jesus' silence before Pilate, the chief priests and the elders, was a silence of expectation and presence. A silence that neither denied nor affirmed what they wanted to know or what they wanted him to say to them. A silence that meant he was fully present to them. He would not reassure them that they were justified in their actions, but he did not speak to them in hate or anger either. His silence meant that they would have to create their own reality of who they decided he was and what course of action they would choose. He would not do that for them. He would not remove their agency. Jesus' silence before his accusers is then echoed by the silence Jesus receives from God as he hangs on the cross. Also, a silence of expectation and presence. Jesus did not hear heavenly words of reassurance from God as he slowly died on the cross. The skies did not open and there was no, Behold my Son, in whom I am well pleased. There was only the silent tears and anguish of God who also died that day among us and because of us. Emmanuel, who was with us to the very end of the line. In that last hour of his life, we might even be able to imagine Jesus looking down from the cross at his mother Mary and the beloved disciple, John, saying to them, through labored breaths, drawn in excruciating pain. If you survive, you live for us. Thank mm-hmm. you.